Hi everybody, welcome back. This is part two of the G7500 Sansui uh, video and this is going to be our last part. We're just going to do the testing. The, the receiver is mostly done. Uh, I will test the tuner at the end of this and if it's working good I'm not going to worry about it. If it needs aligned we'll go through and do the alignment and we're just going to kind of evaluate uh, the preamp and tone control sections. Those orange capacitors that are always in this generation of things should be replaced just for good measure, but I'm probably not going to do them on this one. Um, the person that has it is definitely capable of doing it if he wants to. So without any further ado, I have my one kilohertz signal connected. I have the 8 ohm dummy load. We are connected to our scope and we have the Keithley 2015 set up for the THD and we're just going to do the total harmonic distortion analysis. So let's start out by going over here to the oscilloscope. So let's see what we get. And again, and right around that 120 watt range it's clipping and that looks pretty clean let's go over to the THD meter and check that out all right and I'm gonna bring it up there is 30 watts per channel and climbing there's 80 watts per channel and let's see if I can get it to 90 there's 96 watts per channel and there's your 121 watts per channel it just starts getting up at that 0.1 percent so for a 90 watt receiver <laughs> this thing is performing fantastic all right so let's do our next setup and we're going to do the frequency analysis okay I think I have this thing connected properly let's run the analysis and see if we do yeah let's see what we get okay and I don't think I have any tone control settings set up or anything like that so let me see and let me scale this I'll be right back all right so here are our results and our phase is definitely going all over the place uh, you'll see that on some of these sometimes with respect to frequency but a little more concerning to me is that I have the tone circuit defeated and I have the loudness switch turned off and in spite of all of that we are still seeing a kind of a big boost you know in the bass and then it kind of tails off you're seeing a good 10 dB increase and then it kind of trails off and, and flattens out up to 20 kilohertz and it kind of trails off and goes flat from 1 kilohertz up so from 20 hertz up to 1 kilohertz you actually have uh, you know uh, a bump <laughs> so the amplitude is actually higher so um, I don't know we'll have to look at why it's doing that uh, it could be that the base is boosted or it could be that the treble is being attenuated because of capacitors or something I don't know I think the next thing we should do is switch over to the other channel and see how it compares to this so kind of take a mental note of where we are with this right now and we'll rerun the test on the other channel alright let's try this again this is the left channel now Mm 
Now that looks good. I mean, I don't even have to scale it or anything. You could see it's dead flat all the way across. So there's something going on with that right channel, isn't there? Um, the phase shift doesn't really aff affect anything. I'm not too worried about that. But what I will say is this channel looks really good. And let me move back over to the other channel. Let's do the analysis again. Maybe my test equipment was wacky because I didn't have something set up. Nope, it's flat. Look at that. Okay, that's more like it. <laughs> so obviously when I first did the test, I didn't check my setup. I just plugged it in and turned on the camera and hit the analyze button. And obviously something was not set properly. So that's the right channel again. And in this second test, it's flat as a pancake. You can see the response curve. And it looks very similar to the left channel. So I think we are, uh, I think we're looking good here. So that's why I always kind of, with this frequency analysis, I always do the test more than once because sometimes when you first set it up, uh, if you touch anything while it's doing that, it will affect everything like you saw in the first uh, the first time we ran it through there. So I think that's what that was. So again, as I suspected, this, this amp is running, you know, it's performing perfectly. Okay, we're now back on the big scope and we're going to look at the square wave and just see what it looks like. And let me expand this a little bit so we can kind of see if we're getting any kind of there's there's a hundred watts I don't want to do that for too long because it'll that's really hard on the <laughs> on the output but you can see just absolutely clean and remember these are those old style transistors the MJ uh, 21194 and MJ21193 and uh, or, yeah, I think that's what they are uh, instead of the LAPT high frequency transistors let me see if we can set a measurement here for the rise time hold on okay I've captured a square wave and you can see this thing's cranking at 163 watts uh, into the square wave. And what we're getting on this scope makes it really easy to measure slew rate. So all you do is you just set it to waveform analysis with the little crosshairs and you just put the crosshairs on the two points, you know, the 10 and 90 percent or whatever it is. And then it shows you delta V over delta T, which is 811.6 kilovolts per second. And if you change the units, that'll come out to about 8.1 volts per, mil per microsecond. So 8.1 per microsecond, anything over 7 to 7.5 is good. So um, it's good. Everything's good. So we're connected to speakers now, and I have the uh, music player connected to the auxiliary jack, and I've been listening to this for some time now. And I've been just, this thing is a floor shaker, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> I've been really blasting it to the point my wife came down and was like, what the hell? And uh, throughout all of that, it, th this heat sink's not even lukewarm. I mean, with I have the whole heat sink assembled now. And everything's properly aligned and the power supply heat sinks are warm you know down here but other than that and the the main uh, rectifier diodes are a little bit warm but other than that those are the only things that get warm this amp stays really cool under really high power 
and uh, it's just ear bleeding loud. Now, here's the thing. This, this is my conundrum, everybody. I have the YouTube audio library, and I've downloaded an assortment of songs. I, I go on every now and then, see if any news on there, and it, it's just kind of become a sport to find something really ridiculous to play for all of you. And, I, and if you go through my previous videos, I, I think I found some pretty good ones, but I'm going to find something that I haven't played before, and I don't know what it is, and we're going to play it. And it might totally suck. Or it might just be funny, but I, no matter what, I think it'll be good for a laugh. So let me find something and we'll play it. Okay, I found a good one here. It is called, well, I don't know which one is the title and which one is the artist name, but it's Bok Choi, you know, B-O-K-C-H-O-I, Slink, S-L-Y-N-K. So I don't know if Slink is the artist or that's the name of the song, or if Bok Choi is the artist or the name of the song, but let's just call it Bok Choi Slink. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Okay, I better stop this. Well, that was a lot of synthesizers and compression, I think. But, well, maybe I even outdid myself on that one. Anyway, it does sound good. It works. Let's check the tuner and see what's going on with it. Okay, I have a FM antenna connected, set to, to FM auto. I have the muting off, and well, not good. Oh my! Okay, whenever you tune around and you hear that crunchy sound like that, that usually means that the the uh, rotor contacts on the tuning gang are dirty and need cleaned. So that's this down in here. So what we're going to do is we're going to give this a little bit of a cleaning in here and we're going to lubricate it with a little bit of deoxit and then we're going to try and see if that noise goes away, that crunchy noise when we tune around. Okay, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hit this with some CRC quick drying contact cleaner and uh, this is going to throw the alignment out until it dries so and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get into all of the areas where well let me show you here get the pointer out so all of these areas, you, let me see if I can zoom in so you could see it a little clearer or more clearly for all of you language aficionados that are always yelling at my bad language. So you look in here, there's these little spring clip looking things. I don't know if you can make that out. And there's another one in here. I'll turn the light on. You can kind of see it better now. And these are the things that make contact with this center, with this center shaft. And 
when you hear that crunching noise, see all that crud right there? See how that looks in there? That's what we're trying to remove. We want to clean that out. That's, it's a lubricant, but it also is conductive. And when it dries, it gets kind of waxy and you can kind of see the crust that's in there. I'll show you like right, right along in here, this area here. See that'll, we should be able to just you can kind of scrape that off. I can show you. And we're going to clean that off. And then once we do, we're going to take a little bit of this deoxit D100 like this. And we're just going to put little drops of it in these corners here and then work the, the tuning gang back and forth. Now, if there's any residue whatsoever on these tuning plates, it will throw the alignment of the tuner off. So you have to wait for it to, to totally dry or your tuner accuracy will be out of whack. I don't, usually we shouldn't have to touch the alignment. It should be in unless there's something really seriously wrong, but uh, that's it. And like I said, any of these orange capacitors probably should be replaced eventually, but I'm not going to worry about that. I'll leave that to the owner to do. I think he's more incapable of it. So let me finish cleaning up, and then I will put some deoxid in there, and we'll try and see if that noise goes away. Okay, I got a drop of that deoxid in each one of these little rotor plate, or each of these little contacts here on the shaft. And then we're just going to run it back and forth a whole bunch of times. And you got to be careful not to get any of the oil on, or any of the residue or anything on these plates. Because those fins are, <laughs> they're, they would, it'll throw off the alignment. Okay. And I'm just going to keep going like this back and forth, back and forth. A bunch of times until it's nice and worked in and then we're going to try it again okay turning on and see if that crunchy noise goes away and if it starts to tune All right. how about that even getting the stereo light now Remember, I'm down at the bottom of a hill in a valley, so I don't get very good reception, but... But it's working. Okay, so let's connect the SG-80 and we'll just inject a stereo signal in it and We'll look at it on the oscilloscope and make sure it looks good. Okay, a little bit of repositioning of the camera here. And I am currently set to 98 megahertz with the Sencore SG80. I have a mono signal 400 hertz. And let's see if this will lock onto it. And there we go. Nice. Now, and we look at the scope, nice looking signal, but it is off ever so slightly. We're not right on 98. So let's see if we can walk that in by adjusting the, uh, the trimmer for it. We're then gonna go over here to TC01. I'm just gonna make one small adjustment. So turn this up and you can hear how bad it is. And I'm going to adjust this right here. It's TC01. And let's just look at the scope. And we're going to align it using the scope. And then we'll listen to it after we're done. And see how good we did. Nope, wrong way. There we go. How's that? And it sounds good. Okay, now let's go to bottom of the scale. We're going to go to 
megahertz and let me put it down there bring it in and you can see we're locked right on and take a look where we are we are directly on 88 megahertz so that's all it took to align that now let's put the stereo multiplex and I'll back you up here so you can see it okay go back to 98 this over to 98 and turn on stereo and there's our stereo indicator and we still have a nice looking signal and now let's go to right and left channel so here's left plus right left minus right which they should both be 180 degrees out of phase right only and then this one goes flat left only is going to be out of sync let me change the sync source so uh, you know the stereo separation is perfect let's go back to mono signal and let's see what the smallest signal we can detect is with this so we'll see if our IFs are working properly okay you can see I'm on times one, I have the output set to one microvolt. And you're probably not going to see it on the scope, but if we tune into it, we should be able to bring it in and we should be able to hear the signal. And there it is. You hear it at one microvolt. And if we go to 2.5, we get a pretty good looking signal and that's at 2.5 microvolts and it tunes in really well and when the that's good so I see no reason to do an alignment on this tuner I think it's fine and after doing frequency analysis and everything it tracked really well I did a lot of listening it sounds really good so I don't I'm not inclined to really get into recapping this or not um, if this was a customer that wanted the full meal deal of course I would have but uh, like I said this is going back to my cousin he can do things like that if he wants to and honestly he'll probably be able to play this for a long time and not have to worry about it it sounds wonderful and as I said, the bass on this thing is unbelievable. It just shakes the floor down here. So that's it. Last thing I'll do before I close up shop here is I'll connect my inverse RIAA. Uh, well, actually, I don't even need to do that. I can just use the one built into my buffer amplifier. And I'll feed a signal into the... Uh, phono stage and listen to it and make sure it's performing properly uh, those use those really high quality uh, uh, foil film capacitors they just don't go bad <laughs> so I doubt that there'll be any problems with it unless there's a bad transistor we just want to make sure that that's good if that's all there is then I, we're done time to button this up and send it on its way so with that in mind I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health. This was a fun project, and uh, I'm looking forward to the next thing to come onto the bench. So until then, I wish you all well, take care, and we'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye. Well, I thought this was going to be the end of the video, but then, well, I checked the phono stage as I said I was going to and it is completely dead phono 1 and phono 2 so we're going to have to take this part and find out why now there is a plus and minus 30 volt power supply that goes to that and uh, perhaps there's something going on with that but won't know until we get the bottom back off so that's what we're gonna do all right, let me put this microphone on make all kinds of noise while I do it all right so looking up here 
we have well looking at the schematic first I'll tell you, show you how I know this so right here is your preamp for your phono stage and on pins 20 and 22 you have your negative 30 and positive 30 volt so following that there's 22 and there's 20 and if you follow these wires they go down onto the power supply board and these are the two that we disconnected and marked uh, or I disconnected and marked in the you know, when I had to take the board out so I'm going to see if we have 30 volts plus and minus and let me see if I can get the meter into view I don't know if everything will show up or not. There we go. Got to get everything in view here. All right, flame on. And let's see what we get up here. 32.2 for pin, pin 20. and minus 32.2 for pin 22. So, yep, that's correct. So we have power up to the phono stage. So now we're going to have to trace some signals and see where we're losing it. Oh boy, this isn't good. So looking at some voltages here, Yes, we have our plus and minus 30, but Sansui was definitely so kind as to show us all the voltages we should have here. So, for instance, here's, you know, you have right and left channels, and on the right channel, when I measure here and here, I'm getting 5.5 volts and 5.2 volts, something like that look what it's supposed to be 9 volts and 0 0.12 this side I'm getting like 32 volts on one side and 11 on the other or something weird like that these are wrong instead of 0 0.13 on the emitter of this transistor I'm getting uh, like 11 volts so uh, all of these voltages are completely wrong now I tried disconnecting this connector here, 0103, 0204, which is these two right here, but I knew that wasn't going to really do anything. So the strange thing is the voltages are wrong on both channels, but they're different wrong <laughs> on both channels as well. So they're wrong in two different ways. So, either there's something strange going on I'm not seeing, like in the switching system up here or something, or both channels have been damaged by whatever took out the amplifier board. So I may have to pull this board out and have a closer look underneath to see what happened. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to let you all look over my shoulder. I'm set to diode mode on my meter and I'm just going to go through these transistors and see uh, if any of them are bad. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go these two transistors here at the front end. I'm going to put the negative or the N on the base so that would make it a PNP and see I don't get a reading so I'm going to swap my leads and I'm going to put the red lead on the base. I have voltage drop there, voltage drop there. So this is an NPN and it's good. At least statically it is. So this one's also going to be an NPN on the other channel because they're the same. And again, good, good. I'm going to skip the FETs for right now. Okay, now this one I'm going to do the red on the base. 
I have a little bit of leakage there, but that's components. So I'm going to put the negative on the base. So this one is a PNP, and it is good. So. That's good. Let's see if this one is a PNP also. And it does not appear to be, so let's flip it around. So this is an NPN, and it's good. And this one. is a PNP right here hold on okay that's PNP thought this was nope it's NPN that's weird why is this one reading as a PNP And this one oh no it's okay it's PNP okay we're good never mind <laughs> all right and then this is probably an NPN so let's look at it good 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 so all those transistors are good let's look at, now it's not so easy to check a JFET in circuit so we're gonna go we're just gonna compare one channel to the other so D D3 or FET03 and FET04 are the same for both channels so FET04 and FET03 see FET03 FET04 so they should read the same uh, reading between the two channels. If not, there's something wrong there. So I'm going to put my negative on the drain and go from drain to source. And you can see with negative on a drain, drain to source, I'm getting 55 millivolts. And if I go again from negative to drain to source, getting a little more 67 millivolts. If I go gate to drain, I'm getting a 0.7. And if I go gate to drain on this one, 0.7. So that's pretty close. So I would say these ones are okay. So let's go from negative on the drain again. And I'm going to go source. That's good. Or, I mean gate. And drain to source that's a little bit higher voltage of course we're reading on a capacitor too so these aren't always the easiest things to read and that one source to drain open source to drain this way open so that might be a bad FET. So what I'm going to do is remove it and put it in the component tester. Okay, let's see how this reads. It should be able to read a JFET if it will fit into the little clippy things. There we go. Yep, JFET, it's reading good. So there was just something in circuit that was making it read funny like that. As you can see, it's good. All right, we'll put it back. Okay, I just got done checking all the capacitors with the <coughs> capacitor wizard, and they all look good. None of them look shorted, nor do they look like they're high ESR. So let's take a look at some of the resistors and what resistors on here can we 
would make sense because there's power. So here's your plus or minus 30. And we have these four, they look like fusible resistors, 46, 48, and then what's this one, 45 and 47. And it looks like they're all 100 ohm. So they would be close to where the orange and red wire go. And that would be these four right here. One, two, three, four. So let's see what they are. Has to be something common to everything because both channels are weird. Wait a second. Okay, R46 is open apparently. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a bad resistor. That one's open. What is that one? LR48. Okay. <laughs> R40... What is it? 47? It's open. And R45 is reading 271 ohms, and it's supposed to be 100. All four of those power resistors are bad. All four fusible resistors. So whenever the amp blew up, it blew these resistors out. So we're going to replace these, and hopefully that's all it was. <clears throat> and there's nothing else. See if I have some 100 ohm fusibles. Okay, old resistors out, new resistors in, and I think we should be good. These aren't true fusible resistors, but they're uh, metal oxide, and they should be, they should work okay. You may be inclined to put larger ones in there, but that's not really what you want to do. The idea is these are a good example. They did what they did their job. They protected the rest of the circuit. You know, when something went wrong, these popped open and prevented the rest of this from melting down. So, maybe it's going to work now. Let's check it out and put it together and see. Okay, we're all connected back up. Let's see if we have success or if it goes up in flames. Ooh, <laughs> loud. Okay, that was a terrible noise, but I think it, uh, that was my, oh, I know what that was. I have the preamp, my buffer amp connected to it, and I forgot to switch the inverse RIAA adapter on there, so it was playing a little noise, indicator noise from the computer. Okay, but I'm hearing hum like you would hear from a phono. So let's see what we get now. Let's see if we could put some music up here. How about it? And that is phono. Okay, we have a phono stage working now. All right, let's put it back together one last time. I also found a replacement knob for here that I just put on. It doesn't match this one, but there's a reason. This pot's been replaced. If you notice, this one is just a smooth rotation pot. This one is detented. This one has a knurled shaft on it for this type of, of uh, knob. And this one has a D-shaped shaft 
you know, with the flat on it. And so this has a set screw. So even if you had an original Sansui knob, it would not fit on this because this pot's been replaced at some point in time. It works, there's nothing wrong with it, but whoever replaced it put, it put a different type of pot in there. So neither here nor there, at least there's a knob and it doesn't look too terrible. Okay, as you can see, we have Phono 1 selected. We're using our buffer, pre our buffer amplifier that I built. And I'm, I have it set to the uh, inverse RIAA. And let's start up our song Arabian Sand once again. We're just going to try some of the controls. Guess what else I just noticed? Whoever put that pot in there put a logarithmic taper instead of linear taper pot. So if you notice from negative 10 all the way up to zero, there's hardly any change in the treble. Listen. But as I turn it up, So, <laughs> so that pot's the wrong one. So it should eventually be replaced with the correct one, a linear taper potentiometer for the tone control. Okay, I think we all get the point here. Well, it's working well now, except for that treble pot. And, uh, well, now I think we really have come to the end. <laughs> so for a second time in this video, I wish you all peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And uh, we'll be back with some more videos. And I have lots of projects. I just don't know which one I want to do next. So until then, stay well, take care, and for the second time, bye-bye.